As Pavan said, I'll, I'll primarily talk about um, the ocean today, and I'll talk about that from a policy perspective um, in part and from a conservation broadly of, of biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, as well. Um, in the first part of the talk, I'll just give you a, a little bit of background and then some specific examples of work at CI with regard to um, conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services and how that relates to human well-being. Then I'm going to spend a bit of time specifically talking about uh, work that I've done outside of CI prior to joining CI two years ago uh, on New England fisheries, um, and particularly negotiating recovery plan for New England fisheries, which I was uh, the lead on for a period of time, uh, and then uh, other people have taken over when I left, uh, left government. To give you a specific example of um, trying to implement policy to, if you like, conserve an ecosystem service, that is food provisioning, um, in a highly developed region, the, the northeast of the U.S., the difficulties of actually trying to implement that policy, but actually the results um, if you can implement significant policy action. So with that, um, this is a figure from uh, my colleague Will Turner, who leads one of the teams within the science division at CI, um, looking at a global analysis of the priority for biodiversity related to key biodiversity areas um, on the x-axis and ecosystem service value um, in normalized, if you like, um, on the ordinate. And what you see is the, the, the black areas mean high value, high biodiversity um, priority, in other words, key areas for uh, conservation of endemics. Um, and uh, rare species, which is what key biodiversity areas are focused on. Um, and, of course, Amazon Andes region, um, the Central Africa, uh, um, part, parts of Mexico, and so on. Really, if you know the concept of mega diversity countries, um, the uh, result is that um, the ecosystem service value coincides, high ecosystem service value coincides with areas of high uh, or mega diversity. And that if you look at those, those areas in black, that also would coincide with the major country programs for Conservation International. So it gives you a sense of where we work and why. Um, CI has a partnership with IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, I'll, I'll try to at least say the acronyms as opposed to just speaking acronyms, even though I used to work for NOAA um, in the U.S. government, which is known as the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. It's probably better if I actually spell out the, the terms in case you're not familiar with them. So this is uh, analysis of red list information from IUCN. The red list includes um, species in a number of categories leading up to endangered. Um, that are analyzed in a consistent methodology across the globe. And this was a summary uh, for the red list information that, that Mike Hoffman and a very long list of authors, including me, uh, published uh, last year. The only point I want to make is that while I think you've seen a number of graphs about biodiversity decline, in the Hoffman paper, um, we also looked at what would have happened uh, the red line is what would have happened without conservation action. So while there's still a decline, you see that in fact conservation action can make a, I would argue, significant difference when you look across the entire red list um, uh, data set uh, in slowing that decline. It hasn't by any means halted the decline, uh, but there, it is possible for conservation action to slow the loss of species. Red list pertains to loss of species, not just conservation actions in general, so it's a very particular slice at this problem. Uh, and that's useful to motivate thinking about whether, in fact, we're making any difference at all. Now, of course, in the literature over the last several years, there have been um, publications to the contrary that have said, really, we see no evidence of either um, the impact of biodiversity on ecosystem services or the impact of conservation actions. But if you, again, look at a detailed set of data, um, then you can see some impact from conservation actions. Are you raising your hand to ask? Really quick, that's a question. These are projections based on historical data or projections based on uh, areas with, with and without? With and without. 
Uh, and feel free to interrupt, so that's fine. In fact, I'd rather you ask me questions than my just droning on for hours and hours. So again, the take-home the take message is that conservation action can actually um, have an impact on even such dramatic patterns as, as decline of biodiversity, at least for some um, taxa. For amphibians, that doesn't seem to be the case. So within the overall field of conservation right now, there's been an increasing focus on ecosystem service in support of human well-being as opposed to simply the conservation of biodiversity. And in fact, CI has changed its mission from one of conservation of biodiversity. About three years ago, the, the alteration um, in the mission was to conserve biodiversity, ecosystem services, for its impact on human well-being. So this is a simple graphic of our theory of change, which actually applies across lots of organizations. We take actions that we hope will affect the health of ecosystems, however you like, would like to define health, and you could do it in a number of different ways, just to, as you would define human health in a number of different ways. But at least ostensibly, we would take a set of actions that would um, conserve, maintain, or improve ecosystem health, we expect that will have an impact on ecosystem services, which hence uh, will have an impact on human well-being. Again, the details of defining each of those boxes is an interesting area um, that we're currently working on. In fact, my group is working on and testing um, different approaches uh, in Madagascar at the moment. Um, there's an example here for freshwater. Um, but of course, it's most important to look across a set of ecosystem services, not, a, not at each service individually, because they're not orthogonal. They're not at right angles to, to one another. Um, and it's also important to come up with indicators in each of the boxes, if you like, of the theory of change. That's a fairly concise set. Uh, many of the, the studies that have uh, talked about indicators for ecosystem health have come up with this enormous list you know, a hundred different things that you should measure, uh, which in a policy context actually isn't very useful uh, for two reasons. One, it's very difficult to absorb, and secondly, because people will choose the indicator that they prefer um, and say, well, you know, but in, in my context, I'm doing extremely well because we can see that the, um, you know, soil nitrogen has increased. Uh, and, and that's not very useful out of a very long list of a hundred things. On the other hand, if you can come up with five or six uh, indicators in each box, perhaps a longer list of ecosystem services, then you get a general sense of direction as opposed to an extremely narrow evaluation of ecosystem health. And again, think of the human health analogy. There's a few indicators that um, tell medical doctors where to look, but they don't necessarily tell everything. So every time you have a physical, they do the same five things to start the physical, but then if they need to explore deeper, of course, there's lots of other tests that can be done. Having that kind of a metric of whether, in fact, we're making progress, our actions have had any impact, is quite important in a conservation context, and you would think that it would be a normal course of business, but in fact, it isn't, um, for lots of reasons, which we probably could discuss for a while. It hasn't been the case that people have consistently measured conservation effectiveness um, for ecosystems, services, and human well-being. Uh, and where, while we and others are working towards that end now, it's actually a pretty interesting area to try to come up with the measures that are responsive, um, but not so highly variable that they become meaningless, um, nor are they so stable that it doesn't really make any difference because the indicators never change. It's, it, and I'll show you some examples at the end of the talk on something called the Ocean Health Index that makes some steps in this direction. In addition to trying to measure conservation effectiveness, there's also um, a need to actually set priorities. What are the areas that you want to focus on? We could say, of course, every species is important. Um, every ecosystem is important. That's quite true. Um, in some sense, but it's not very helpful for an organization like ours with a, you know, reasonable but not extraordinary budget. Well, I guess that's a matter of opinion. Um, the, uh, 
So it, it wouldn't be an extraordinary budget to you. It's about $150 million a year, so the sort of more normal course of thing. No, I, you know, it, $150 million a year for an organization of 1,000 people spread across the globe means that you have to set some priorities. So how do you choose where to work? Well, you choose where to work based on your mission. You also want to choose where to work based on that connection in the theory of change in the previous slide. Where is biodiversity, ecosystems, or ecosystem health, including biodiversity, ecosystem services, and human well-being connected in a, in a focused way? Now, in the past, CI has been very successful at utilizing uh, biodiversity hotspots concept as a way of setting priorities. And what we've now um, begun to do quite extensively is, is to map ecosystem service values, particularly to populations in need, a shorthand here to the poor, um, onto those biodiversity hotspots to ask the question, so if you can serve biodiversity, is that sufficient to provide ecosystem service value? And the answer is often, but not entirely, in two ways. Um, first of all, there are other areas that become important, for example, for freshwater services that are not strictly um, within a hotspot construct. Most of the area is, is covered by biodiversity hotspots across the tropical developing world where we work, but there are other areas that become important. There are also other areas that are quite important for things such as carbon sequestration and climate regulation, such as agricultural lands, which may not be a focus for biodiversity hotspots. The second way that the picture becomes modified is if you set your priorities based on a single ecosystem service, and I don't have a specific slide of this, so you'll have to uh, hopefully follow the argument, and I can refer you to a paper by Frank Larson from my group. If you set your priorities based on a single service like carbon sequestration, um, and then another service, freshwater service provision or biodiversity. Um, what you find is that if you set them solely on, say, biodiversity, then you don't do a very good job of meeting all of your other goals. On the other hand, if you back off on the biodiversity goal slightly, and you also include considerations for carbon and freshwater, for example, you find that you will get 90% of the, the biodiversity conservation value in your priorities, but you'll get a much higher percentage of the other two. And so there's some trade-off analyses to be done on how you set priorities when you look in an ecosystem service context. Now that becomes important in a given landscape because I think we have assumed for a long time that as long as you were conserving, conserving the biodiversity, you really had covered the other aspects with regard to things such as carbon sequestration and um, fresh water. Uh, food provisioning, and so on. And that turns out not to be exactly true. It's close, but it's not exactly true. And so you need to modify the priority setting to actually inco incorporate multiple services, and you get a different result. It's not drastically different, but it's importantly different. Hopefully that was intelligible. And again, Frank Larson published that trade-off analysis. Yes? Um, so I'm looking at this ecosystem service value from before. Yeah. So this is realized services, in other words, available, but doesn't necessarily deal with all of the access issues and is not a valuation based on payment for ecosystem services strictly. It's access of those services to the poor for a set of services, in this, and in this case, you know, there's climate reserves, flood management, fresh water provisioning to populations in need. So it's basically localizing populations in need. Um, and saying this service becomes available as opposed to how much would they pay for it. The value of the service is, is a broader, what do we believe a cubic meter of water in this locale is worth, not the value of the service to the poor people. You see the distinction? Yep. I was wondering also how fine-grained is that data, right? No. Australia is completely blue. The US seems to be mostly blue. Yeah. So the, not very um, in, in this global analysis. It's not particularly fine-grained. It's really quite coarse. Um, 
the challenge of doing this and the previous work is do you have something that's scalable such that you could actually apply the concept at a landscape level up to a country level or even a regional level and you could set your priorities from a, from a landscape level to a, to a country level up to a regional level. And to do that, um, you're likely going to start with the course data, but as you try to downscale um, to a, a landscape level, you'll run into some data problems. So then the question is how, how robust is the result? Uh, so that's, you know, an, an analog to that is trying to downscale climate impact or, or um, climate effects from the global models. The difference here is that you need to do more than the physics. Um, so you've got much higher dimensionality than in a climate model. But still, you don't have very good fine scale data in some locations. What you then do is you try to base it off the global data sets and then ground truth it with selected fine scale data so that you can get to the landscape level. But again, it's, it, it's ecosystem service value in general delivered to an area where there's a high concentration of, of people in poverty, if, to get back to the previous question. And if I forget to look to the left, then somebody shout out at me, I don't mind. Um, I am a former regulator, I'm used to being yelled at. Um, so now let me talk about ocean, ocean issues a little bit. And generally, if you ask um, even a fairly broad audience, so what, what do you get from the ocean? You'll get two things. And even if, if, if somebody had a vague idea of what ecosystem services were, uh, one of them is you get fish, so food, and the other one, recreation. And beyond that, probably you wouldn't hear very much. You know, a lot of people like to be near the ocean for recreational reasons and actually fisheries are an incredibly important source of high quality protein even if the tonnage is not nearly the same as agricultural tonnage and incidentally um, tend to have a much lower ecological footprint um, than any other form of food provisioning or almost any other form any other major form of food provisioning I suppose that we should include uh, wild uh, gathering as well but in fact, um, lots of other things come from the ocean, including climate regulation, um, shoreline protection, and so on, and certainly waste disposal, and so on. So it's, it's pretty clear that while we tend to think of um, terrestrial sources for providing many of the ecosystem services, even in the Millennium Ecosystem sense, which I know you're all familiar with, um, many of those same services, at least a portion of them, come from ocean ecosystems, and sometimes a very significant portion. Certainly climate regulation, you would have to argue, is probably dominated by the ocean, at least as a heat sink, as well as in terms of carbon. Um, food provisioning, it depends, um, but certainly for high quality protein. Obviously, uh, a number of other recreational services are incredibly important. I'm not including here things like mineral extraction or shipping, which are not really ecosystem services. I guess driving a ship over the surface of the ocean is a service in some sense. If it was dry, it wouldn't happen, but I'm not really thinking of that as an ecosystem service. On the other hand, in some cases there are, is a serious trade-off to be considered with regard to getting goods to land through a port, um, which has impacts on ecosystems and in some sense is a trade-off with a set of services. Uh, I guess that's not going to advance from the mouse. Um, it's also fairly clear that in most cases we have treated ocean and coastal areas much as we've treated many of the land areas. That is, we've used an ex exploitative model that says here's just a resource to be used. Uh, there's many famous quotes about ocean resources being inexhaustible, um, often attributed, attributed probably unfairly to Huxley. You know, you could never possibly overexploit fish stocks because the ocean is too big, um, which has turned out to be um, almost completely untrue. I can't think of any resource that uh, that would be true for. But also, co coastal development itself has had a huge impact on um, the services an ocean can provide and the health of coasts itself. And so one of the challenges is, can we come up with an approach to utilizing ocean areas um, that 
is sustainable as opposed to unsustainable because many of the practices we currently use are unsustainable. Um, how many of you have been to the Mediterranean sometime in the last 10 years? It's a spectacularly beautiful empty ocean. <laughs> um, fisheries mesh size, there's a big has been a big argument over whether it should be 30 millimeters or 40 millimeters for trawl nets in the Mediterranean. Um, you've got an armored coast in a lot of areas, um, very strange nutrient dynamics. You've got a few areas that are still healthy. It's been exploited for a really long time, as have other areas. Um, but it, it's, in some sense, a poster child for unsustainable exploitation of ocean and coastal resources, and not the only one. Um, so we certainly have plenty of experience in um, uh, an unsustainable development model for ocean areas. Now that doesn't mean that the Mediterranean no longer provides any services. It doesn't mean that it's ugly. <laughs> it doesn't mean even that no fisheries occur there, even though most of what you get out of there is about that big, um, with a few exceptions. Uh, but it means that you've lost a huge amount of the ecosystem service and therefore the ecosystem service value. But most people think it's a pretty spectacular place to go vacation or to live or to work on. Um, how come? I mean, if it's lost so much value, why aren't people going, yuck? It's not just because it's sunny and warm and, you know, the French and Italians know how to cook. I guess the Spanish, too. Um, there, the, you know, there are other reasons. Well, there still is ecosystem services there, and many of them are quite extraordinary. But there was a huge reservoir to deplete, if you like, over you know, a couple of thousand years at least. Um, so we should be careful to imagine that it's sort of an on-off switch that the services go away. Even in the Mediterranean, there's relatively few marine species that have gone extinct, although some have. Um, it's likely that many of the shark species um, are, will have or will completely disappear, for example. But it's not gone, it's just severely depleted. And that raises the question, could you get back to a sustainable development path? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think you've had earlier lectures that have talked about switching between states and the difficult so-called nonlinearities between states of an, of an ecosystem and the difficulty of recovering back to another state. Sometimes that seems to be possible, sometimes not. What is often the observation is even if you can recover an ecosystem, ocean ecosystem or terrestrial, um, that the state that you recover to was not the original state. You, it's, an unpredictable, it's unpredictable where you'll land. And so um, this is not just true in the Mediterranean, it's true in many, many other areas for, for oceans. Um, if we, you take a simple look at um, coral ecosystems, even in the Western Pacific, relatively lightly exploited, Near developed islands, you see a relatively depleted um, coral with not a lot of fish, although some. As you move up a gradient to relatively remote, or extremely remote, in some cases, I think this is Palmyra, um, where there aren't any people, then you see a very different ecosystem. Um, a much more robust set of corals. Um, now lots of large uh, predatory fishes, or in fact, instead of just a complete food web, which we often think of as a pyramid in these, in places like Palmyra, you have an inverted pyramid where most of the biomass is actually at the top, top levels of a food web, um, which means a couple of things. I mean, it, it, it relates to spatial scale and temporal scale. Um, spatial scale because there's lots of migration in. Um, temporal scale because very long-lived creatures are, can be supported at a high biomass level. Um, uh, as long as they're supported by relatively high turnover. It also turns out that these kinds of ecosystems are much more resilient to things such as coral bleaching events, um, climate change impacts more broadly, um, certainly other impacts including some fishing uh, than these kinds of systems. And again, even this system, if you compared it to the Caribbean, is lightly impacted. <laughs> Um, or you compare it to the Mediterranean, for example, it would be lightly impacted. So we do know that there are really significant differences between impacted systems and unimpacted systems. It doesn't mean that it's feasible to have a remote, fully um, 
a functioning ecosystem in all locales, but you need to recognize that gradient and the fact that it's almost certainly nonlinear. So one of the programs that um, Conservation International has worked on for the last five years is called the Marine Managed Area Science Program, MMAS. And um, what we did is try to establish effectively zoning approaches in um, four principal areas, uh, western, one in, in Fiji, one in Brazil, one in um, Belize, and another in Galapagos, and then compare to as many other studies that we could find of marine protected areas or zoned areas around the world across the tropics in areas that supported coral reefs. So we actually had a conservation program in those four areas and compared it with as, as many other data sets as possible around the globe. Um, and the goal was not to simply create protected areas, but to create a gradient uh, from fully protected to open access uh, with some other options in between. And so in Belize, here's two years um, of comparing fish biomass inside and outside a managed area with higher biomass inside a managed area as opposed to an open access area which is a fairly predictable result. You will have seen some of these graphs from people like Callum Roberts, um, certainly Steve Gaines, Ben Halpern, and others before. Um, and so it's now a well-known result, no big surprise. This is my short course in population dynamics for all of you who haven't studied population dynamics before. If you don't kill the animals, they don't die so fast. So that's what that says. Now you know all there is to know about population dynamics and can move on. Um, in a, if you protect an area, and in fact there's a significant biomass of fish in the area, it's relatively important, then um, you can expect that they will, that higher biomass either will be conserved within the area or may grow substantially because the fish and other creatures are allowed to, allowed to grow within, within that area. Now, that works really well when things stay in one place, and it but it can still work even for migratory species as long as the vulnerability within that area is high, you've protected them for a portion where that vulnerability can't be made up outside the area. Or another way to put that is the area is large enough such that there's a significant fraction of protection inside a, a protected area. The principle of you know, marine managed areas is the same as you would have in a terrestrial environment. And in fact, you know, I mean, I once had somebody say to me, you know, you can't possibly know how many fish there are in the sea unless you can count them exactly like you count trees in the forest, to which I replied, that's true, fish are exactly like trees except you can't see them and they move, so they're pretty easy to count. In other words, things are going to move in and out of these areas in a much different way than a protected park. They're, they're, and your ability to measure these things is going to be much less than, of course, in a terrestrial environment. But we've now established the principle that for sizing um, and siting of protected areas in many places. And we know that, in fact, you'll get high bio, higher biomass um, in, for at least many of the species. Here's another example from Brazil, where now you have a gradient from you know, relatively long established no-take marine reserves to relatively new multiple access areas and complete over, open access. And you might ask, so why do open access areas increase here and then decrease as well? Well, because protected areas do two things, because things move, unlike trees. One of them is you increase the biomass in the area. The second is they seed outside the area. So they provide a refuge that allows for movement outside the area. And you might actually increase biomass outside the area for a short period of time. The problem is it's short-lived because then targeting or exploitation of that biomass can happen very rapidly but we get a consistent pattern of improvement based on protected areas. I guess the, and so you'll see higher density, higher fish biomass, increased species, etc. I suppose the question is, so what? I mean, why is it important to have a lot more fish in a protected area? Anybody want to tell me why? Because I can't figure it out. No, I mean, I mean, why would you, why does it matter that you've just increased biomass? It's a nice thing. I mean, we like fish. We'd like them to live longer. But there must, must be some reason beyond that. 
Did you want to ask a question or you want to answer mine? <laughs> Okay, it's easier than measuring biodiversity. Why do we care that there's more biodiversity? I mean, you said that fish be in, and I think it's probably just because of it, because of how people will target right outside the protected areas in order to okay. they're benefiting from the fact that there's different areas of protected areas. And in fact, you saw an example of that from Pavan's lecture, I think, in an early, or at, at the beginning of the course for New England, the area that I'm going to talk about in a minute of there's a lot of migration outside. But fundamentally, that biomass, if it becomes utilized, supports human well-being. Or if it becomes, and it can be utilized in lots of different ways. That utilization could be the biomass provides for greater nutrient cycling. It could be because people get to eat it. It could be because it supports recreation. But we're making an assumption in many cases that more biomass or more biodiversity actually goes to improve human well-being, remember that theory of change. So we're trying to move beyond now simply saying, well, you know, we'd like the fish to live longer because we like fish. They're very pretty. They're providing some kind of ecosystem service and we believe that those services are important for human well-being, not just because you can eat fish. And so then the question becomes, if you encourage people in a local community to establish a marine managed area, as we did in this study, do they see any benefit or are they just, you know, now they live in a poor community on the coast of Brazil, but they can feel like they've made an important contribution to conservation on the planet? No, they would actually, just like people anywhere else, like to see, you know, more options for employment, if this thing works, um, greater income, and so on inside a managed area versus outside a managed area. So again, we need to validate that theory of change that in fact, the improvement in services results in a real improvement in human well-being. And those measures tend to be income, health, and um, stability of a community, and so on. Now in, uh, this, uh, I don't know where that picture is from. The CI is really good at putting pictures that don't necessarily relate to the graph, but let's assume this is one of the marine managed areas. Um, I don't happen to know where that one is from, but did have an opportunity to visit um, the area where uh, of, of Brazil, the Abroios area of Brazil, where we had established one of the sites for the Marine Managed Areas Program. And in fact, the protected areas, both fully protected and um, partial use areas, had been in place for 10 years. Um, and the village then was able to obtain electricity because of higher income. They were able to do something different with their schools because of higher income, as well as livelihoods and income opportunities for people within the village. It's a pretty interesting place because it was a small island across a narrow creek. They had made a decision as a village not to allow any motorized vehicles on the island. Um, but they still, and, and they had obtained from the government the opportunity to establish reserves where they had um, exclusive rights of access to certain portions um, of the area. So they actually had some ownership. Um, and when I was there, they were celebrating a 10 year anniversary of establishing the reserve and the things that it brought into that village. So there is a direct connection to what happens to people in communities, or, and sometimes a direct connection into a broader set of ecosystem services. Things like climate mitigation may or may not bring direct benefits locally. It depends on how they're structured. Fisheries tend to be much more locally focused. Oops, did I go the wrong way? So to go back to the idea of priority setting then, um, you need to do the same thing in the oceans. What are the most diverse areas? Where are they impacted? And where are the most vulnerable human populations? It becomes a little bit more difficult in the ocean, but effectively we're evaluating biodiversity threats and, and high value habitats in the same way as we do terrestrially. It's just the ocean's a really, really big place and the data is even sparser than it is on land. Um, so, um, you can, in fact, map biodiversity in terms of species richness. Probably you can use other diversity measures, but richness is probably a reasonable um, starting point in many cases. There are some analyses I'll show you of threats um, and then um, value of habitats for ecosystem services. <clears throat> 
So from IUCN data and from things like the Census of Marine Life, you can obtain marine biodiversity data to measure richness. You can also look at species endemism, places that are particular for individual species for conservation of both local and global biodiversity. So there's a, a number of different ways to get at this question of where are the places where you have the highest degree of endemic species. Um, looking at drivers of change um, is, again, there are global data sets. It's quite difficult. Ben Halpern and company in the next slide have compiled a broad set of impacts um, in a paper in 2008 um, that has tried to say where are the impacts most intense, where do they overlay with one another, one another on a global basis, and now have, in the last three years, have now downscaled those analyses to look at particular impacts in particular marine ecosystems, although I'm not showing you those slides. So for example, um, they've done an analysis of the Mediterranean that should come out um, fairly soon that looks at what are the principal impacts in different portions of the Mediterranean, from shipping to fishing to pollution, climate, you know, um, warming temperatures and the like. Uh, a couple of things come out from the global analysis. One is there really aren't, um, or there are hardly any places that have low impact from human activities. Um, and secondly, the intensity of that impact is more or less as you would expect, but there's some surprises, such as, um, you know, in the middle of the Pacific, there's very intense, okay, that thing died. Um, there's some very intense um, impacts, uh, which can be due to things like ocean circulation patterns. So you, yep. I think so. Well, generally, um, I noticed that the coasts are very high. Is that driven by data? Or more, is it driven by more species like in the shallow water? Um, I think it's, a, it, it's both. First of all, we don't know that much about deep sea species, so we're still looking primarily in photic zone and some, some additions. Um, and secondly, productivity is highest near the coast. So you would expect, in some sense, a um, higher number of species because you get higher niche separation and all of that in a higher um, environment. Of course, you have higher um, diversity on western, you know, in western boundary current, uh, sorry, eastern boundary current areas than western boundary current areas. And there's some other patterns like that, high diversity in the tropics. Um, but it is a common, uh, some of it is data lack just because the deep sea is so poorly known. Um, and probably will continue to be for some time because it's very, very hard to get significant funding for uh, a lot of deep sea work. If you included microbial diversity, then of course these numbers are gigantic. Um, but there's relatively little known about microbial diversity in, the, uh, in ocean waters. So the real question is, how do, you, how do you put the two together, biodiversity and impacts? It's not just biodiversity. For your priority setting, it's also impacts. What's the overlay between them? Um, and then, and you can do that, exactly that analysis. And again, we find that the areas where you have um, high rarity and high impact, um, as well as those areas that have high richness and low impact, tend to be the places that we see I work across the tropics. So, although we don't happen to work in the Caribbean very much, which is a high impact area, but we do work um, on the coast of South America. We have intensive marine work um, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific seascape. Um, there are important areas in Galapagos, of course, um, and some in, uh, along the um, coast of Colombia. These areas are relatively poorly known, in part, for marine species, so that's probably not a very good representation of, of Africa. It's not that they're low impacted or have no diversity, they're just not as well known as the other areas. Um, and if we actually wanted, as we do want to, want to end up with a priority setting mechanism, um, then we want to look at uh, a range of, uh, well, how those, that overlay of biodiversity and um, impacts relate to 
uh, some measures of, of human dependence on those resources, whether it be human development index or dietary um, portion of dietary animal protein from marine resources, which is that one. You could probably read it better than I do because I don't have glasses on, and so on. Um, so that's how we are trying to construct a priority setting mechanism for the oceans. And again, it needs to be scalable down to, if you like, a seascape level um, because the global analysis just tells you, well, the areas that you're already focusing on generally are the right ones. That's no big surprise. But if you can scale it down now to an ecosystem level or a large marine ecosystem level, it becomes much more interesting. Okay, let me turn to fisheries. Um, the, uh, we used to call, I'm actually trained as a fishery biologist. I'm probably the only one you will ever meet. Um, the, uh, we used to, in the fisheries community, call, you know, working in fisheries was referred to as picking up the wrong pamphlet at the career counselor's door. Um, it uh, tends to be very contentious. I want to use it as an example of um, really a, a sectoral approach to trying to implement conservation actions, whether conservation and management actions, conservation actions, however you want to phrase that. So this is a combination of world capture fisheries and aquaculture production from FAO. Uh, I think you might have seen this before. Um, the dark blue is including China. The lighter blue is excluding China. Anybody happen to know why uh, these are separated out in this way? Anybody read this paper? Why, why would we separate out China? Two reasons. Somebody make a guess, please. Because it's China. <laughs> because it's China. OK, that's, that's a third reason. It is correct. <laughs> why else? Yeah, they have a huge, compared to any other place, a gigantic aquaculture production, particularly an increase in production. Why else? Uh, no, this is just actually captured fisheries and aquaculture production. So there was some, um, there were real questions about particularly the capture fishery um, statistics from China a few years ago. And this is not particularly, you know, taking uh, cheap shots at, at China, but it, it, um, a colleague of mine, Daniel Pauly at University of British Columbia, looked at the FAO statistics and said, wow, China is producing an awful lot of capture fisheries. How can that be? And it turned out that the, the statistics are compiled on a country basis by FAO. And the country reports for China were based on production for regions. Um, and the reward for the people who were reporting the statistics was based on how much production they had reported. And so um, he did some ecosystem analyses from one of his modeling methods called Ecopath and said, it doesn't actually appear that those ecosystems could produce anything like that amount of fish. Uh, and it turned out that there was substantial misreporting of the statistics because the incentive was to report very high numbers because that's how you were rewarded. And it only really shows up for China. Now, if anyone in the room believes that that only happens in China, then I you know, would like to sell you some property. Um, but you know, so it happens almost everywhere. Um, but because China is so big, it has a dramatic effect on the statistics. Yes? Thanks, Andrew. That's, that's enlightening. And in fact, I just want to add a little story from my own experience. Um, once my senior economist at Deutsche Bank in Singapore pointed out to me that, have you seen the latest Chinese state-wise GDP statistics? I said, no. Well, he showed me his list of numbers. And he says, by the way, these numbers are all higher than 9%. And for information, the official GDP growth in China is 8.5%. But all the states are above the average. So that gives you an example yeah. of what statistics it's a little bit like Garrison Keillor, all the children are above average. Right. <laughs> yes? So is this a corrective graph or is this? This is actually, um, this one is corrected. And it, originally, world capture fisheries continued to increase. And what's happened is instead, actually, aquaculture production has increased very dramatically in China. And world capture fisheries have leveled off. I think I've didn't put in the capture fishery alone. Um, so this is, is a corrected graph because capture fisheries are about 80 to um, 90 million metric tons a year and the remain, remainder is aquaculture. Actually this year, because this only goes up to 2002, 
Um, this, this current year is the first year where aquaculture production has probably equaled capture fisheries. So this is a, a corrected graph, but since then people have tended to separate out the Chinese statistics. Now in this case it's because of the aquaculture growth. But there's a very, th this is a problem again globally in reporting statistics. What's the incentive for any place, you know, again this is not just because China is the only place that's misreporting, it's very broadly the case. It's very hard to get production numbers. That would be true in agriculture, it would be true in lots of other, other settings for many countries. Um, just out of curiosity, so this is a slightly odd pattern right here. Anybody want to guess what that little dip is? It's actually real. Come on, somebody must be able to guess. This is the Yale School of Forestry. Give me a break. Yep. Flood in 1998? No, it, it's not, although that's a pretty good, it's related to that. El Nino. El Nino, yeah. So why would El Nino have such a big impact on, in this case, capture fishery production? Because the largest fish catch in the world is Peruvian anchoveta. And when an El Nino occurs, Peruvian anchoveta doesn't do very well because there's a switching behavior with sardine, but it moves um, further offshore and production is much lower. And actually can be seen in global statistics when you have a severe El Nino, which also was, of course, the reason for the floods. <laughs> Um, so that's why it's related. So now you have about 50% of the production from aquaculture and 50% from capture fisheries and some people believe that we'll ultimately end up with aquaculture only. Only problem with that is that most aquaculture, many types of species that are cultured actually depend on wild production. So the other problem with that is the ocean is 70% of the planet. You know, that's an awful lot of aquaculture production so it's not quite the same as land conversion for agriculture. Um, and capture fisheries are probably going to be around for quite a while. Again, 80 to 90 million metric tons is about the world fish catch. And in fact, it's been flat for the last decade. Now that's not because people are no longer concerned about catching fish, nor is it because people have been backing off substantially on effort. It means we're no longer finding new fisheries to continue the increase that happened since the 1950s. Um, you can no longer compensate by finding new resources to exploit to keep the growth going as other resources are either leveled out or depleted. Um, which is quite um, important. It means that we can't rely on very much more ocean production other than increases in aquaculture production as a food security issue. I used to work with a guy named John Gulland. I shouldn't tell too many stories because I'm going too long. but. I used to work with a guy named John Gulland who was at FAO in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. And um, a lot of people were trying to estimate what would be the ultimate world fish catch and he said 80 to 90 million metric tons. Um, the other estimates were 300 million metric tons, 500 million metric tons, we'll just take all the krill out of Antarctica and so on. And you know, 30 years before we reached the peak he got it pretty much right. He was also the only guy I ever saw who could chair an international meeting, fall deeply asleep on the first day, wake up on the last day, and accurately summarize the meeting. Um, but he got it right um, at about 80 to 90 million metric tons. Okay, so I'm not going to go into a long discussion of fishing and overfishing, but for, sorry, go ahead. No, I think they probably will remain. Um, if, in fact, we do a good job of management, there could be some slight increases, but they will remain within the range of 80 to 90 million metric tons. Aquaculture will continue to increase. Prices, oh, um, almost certainly it means that prices will continue to rise. And of course, in many places, fish is no longer a, a co commodity product, it's a luxury product, certainly in the US. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. So fisheries, again, as a sectoral example, in some ways is a bit different from other ecosystem services because we have a fairly well-developed theory about how the populations work. So this is the slightly longer course in population dynamics. Um, fish populations compensate for increased mortality or fishing pressure, uh, represented by fishing rate, which increases to the left. Um, and that compensation, 
um, in their population dynamics allows for higher reproduction, higher growth rates, which allows for more yield. That comes to a maximum at a particular exploitation rate. So at some point when you're removing some fraction of the of an individual population, or if you like an aggregate of populations, it achieves some maximum, usually referred to as maximum sustainable yield in at least an equilibrium or stationary model. Um, and if you exceed that fishing rate, you would expect the population or populations to decline. Well, most ecosystem services don't have a simple generating function. So while we know what the you know, what might be a reference point for fisheries, maximum sustainable yield, and we might know one for climate because we have global climate models that, and we've said we don't want more than a certain degree temperature rise globally. We don't have the same kind of reference points for nutrient cycling or storm protection or climate adaptation and the whole set of ecosystem services that you would see in the millennium ecosystem sense. But in fisheries, we do. So that means we kind of know what we need to do. You don't want the exploitation rate, the proportion of the stock that you remove every year due to fishing, to exceed a particular le level. Because if you do, the stock will decline. In other words, it's pretty simple. We know what we need to do. Control the fishing rate. Therefore, the populations will be maintained. There's other factors, habitat and so on which obviously are going to, in the past at least, have related mostly to fishing rate, although sometimes to other kinds of activities. So on a sectoral basis, this should be quite simple to manage. Um, this is a too complicated graph uh, that relates to using different management measures. But, but the point I want to make is that if you looked at maximum sustainable yield for this graph, uh, which happens to be modeled on COD, it would probably be over here but the ac maximum long-term economic yield will always be at a lower fishing rate. And that's a fairly general result for most fisheries, certainly most fisheries models, that's been around for quite a while. So in, a, in order to get the greatest economic return on a sustainable basis, you have to fish even less than you would a maximum sustainable yield rate. And that's not just because of stochasticity or variability in the population, it's because of the economics of fisheries to try to, um, and so you will obtain more in the long term at a lower uh, harvest rate. Well, there's a lot of um, press stories that say, you know, most fisheries in the world are collapsing. Um, that turns out, actually, compared to a reference level of maximum sustainable yield, not to be true. Uh, roughly 28 to 30 percent of the stocks um, in the world that are measured by FAO, again, uh, are considered to be overexploited. Roughly 60% of the stocks are either overexploited or fully exploited. In other words, we wouldn't expect them to yield anymore. And then the remainder um, potentially could be exploited slightly higher, but you wouldn't get a huge amount of additional yield out of that. That's why we're still in the 80 to 90 million metric ton range. So when people say all the stocks are overexploited, at least for the present period, that's not true. Historically, that's a different question compared to what happened a hundred years ago, and I'll describe that in a minute. So it's important to keep that figure in mind. At least management-wise, there's a significant fraction of stocks, about 28%, that are overexploited. Um, and then many more that are managed around the reference point. Again, we kind of know what to do, and in some cases we've done it, is the summary of that. Internationally, um, fisheries are, well, within 200 miles of every coastal state, under the law of the sea, um, there's an exclusive economic zone, which means that that coastal state has exclusive right to those fisheries resources to do with as they like. Now, they've signed on in the law of the sea and something called the UN Fish Stocks Agreement to try to utilize, uh, to not overexploit, to sustainably manage their fish stocks in their national zones as well as outside around a maximum sustainable yield level. So what happens outside of 200 miles? Well, there, on the high seas, again, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, which was negotiated in 1995, um, pertains, and it says we should try to maintain those stocks on the high seas at a level that will at least produce, that should produce maximum sustainable yield. In other words, not overexploit them. Well, how does that work? Because there's no international jurisdiction. And it effectively works by treaty agreements and regional fishery management organizations. And these are some of them that are 
are listed here. Um, each are established by a separate treaty, each have member states, and the rules that they come up with are dependent upon how the member states behave. Um, in other words, what they agree to. I was actually the US delegate for uh, this one, um, and I've had some work with Camelar, which is the Antarctic one, and uh, with ICAT, the uh, Commission for Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, and for a couple of others that I didn't list there, like the Salmon Convention and so on. And basically what happens is that the member states get into a room and each argue on behalf of their share of the fishery for their state. Um, generally the delegations are heavily industry um, focused um, and each, if you like, uh, coastal state or member state then argues for their largest share of the quota they can get. And so what happens when you have to reduce the fishing pressure? Well, the easiest thing to do if you're trying to decide who gets, you know, what piece of the pie is to first agree that the pie is bigger than you thought. <laughs> um, because then everybody gets a little bit bigger, bigger piece. And so the history of many of the organizations is in fact that they've allowed over exploitation on the high seas. Uh, that's slowly changing. Probably the International Commission for Conservation of Atlantic Tunas is the poster child for how to do this badly, um, with particularly over-exploitation of, of bluefin tuna, um, which is highly vulnerable, and some other species. But there are rules. It's just how the coastal states behave in those four, because the decisions are based on those uh, member states in each of the commissions. And there are rules then on every state controlling its vessels wherever they fish, and so on. Now, it's under international law, so it's very imperfectly enforced. There is an international standard on the fish stocks agreement, and then there are a whole set of bilateral agreements. So it is not that it's anything goes on the high seas, it's just very difficult to agree in international areas that people should take responsible action with regard to their industry compared to other industries. Um, and, it, you know, it's an interesting thing to do, although um, passingly strange, um, to be in these negotiations because, you know, they generally are elaborate games of, you know, um, you show me your cards, then I'll show you mine. Um, so you kind of sit there all night until finally in the morning when everybody's too tired, you make some kind of an agreement to not overexploit quite as much as you used to. Um, and, and then everybody goes home and congratulates each other and then you do it again the next year. So it's gotten a lot better, but it's still a really difficult process. We know that over, that over exploiting fish stocks, first of all, it has occurred. It does have ecosystem level effects, so it doesn't matter just for the cod or for the tuna. It has much broader set of effects. This is from a National Academy study from a few years ago. Um, Pavan showed you a, a, a picture from, again, from Daniel Pauly on fishing down food webs, in other words, cropping off from the top. Many other kinds of patterns occur that you see in a food web sense throughout, throughout an, uh, an ecosystem. And if we look historically, and this is for some work that I did with colleagues in New Hampshire, in this happens to be on the Scotian Shelf, we know that we've very severely depleted um, many ecosystems, including uh, the northeast, northeast shelf, um, from historical levels. So here's a biomass estimate from the 1850s, based on actually really good data. And there's currently where the biomass is for Scotian shelf cod stocks. And the sustainable yield, as estimated by the Canadians, would be probably about there. Well, compared to 1.2 million metric tons of biomass in the 1850s, that's a pretty big change. So this is definitely an altered ecosystem. That's the average size, six pounds, that was the average size in the 1850s. And so we know that these are altered ecosystems, much like an agricultural ecosystem is altered due to exploitation. Does anyone think we would get back to 1.2 million metric tons? No. On the other hand, does the system have much greater capacity to produce a service, in other words, food, even on a sustainable basis? Absolutely. I'm gonna skip the next one. Here's an example from the coast of Maine to bring it to people. So in 1861, 223 sailing vessels before the dory fishery, so they were fishing over the side of schooners, fishing in the Gulf of Maine, 
caught 12,000 metric tons of fish. The mechanized fleet in the Gulf of Maine in 2007 caught 3,000 tons. So we've again reduced the availability of that service just in terms of food provisioning. Now, this was not an unexploited ecosystem in, 18, in 1861. It had already been exploited for 200 years. So we've fundamentally changed the, the, the productivity of these systems. It may change back. It's unclear how far back it can go. So now um, let me talk about recent management for fisheries. I know I'm running a little long, but that's too bad. I'm standing up here, and you just have to vote with your feet. Um, this is the recent history of landings for U.S. fisheries for so-called ground fish, cod, haddock, yellowtail, flounder, pollock, 19 actual, actually 19 stocks in the ground fish complex, but these three, cod, haddock, and yellowtail, flounder being the primary ones, from 1960 into the, uh, to the end of the century. And the vertical lines are different stanzas of management. First, international quotas, voluntary quotas, then under 200 mile ex extended jurisdiction under the law of the sea and actually US unilaterally declared 200 mile limit a year before it was agreed internationally um, and then several other plans which resulted in a decline, a decline, a short blip and a long decline in landings this is not biomass if you looked at biomass you'd see much the same thing it was mirroring landings at that time down to really a cod fishery with not much in it in the mid-90s. So you might ask the question, so what the heck was all that management stuff if that's the result of trying to manage an, for natural capital for an ecosystem service, if you like, for a single sector? This is just managing the fishery. Could be that lots of other things were happening. This is over-exploitation. In 1990, the exploitation rate was about 66% of the standing stock every year of haddock was removed. The sustainable rate was about 20%. And we were arguing bitterly at the time that um, whether the sustainable rate was, you know, 20% or 25%. What difference does it make? You're harvesting 66%. So it doesn't really matter, but you couldn't actually move forward in management until that argument was settled, believe it or not. For cod, again, here's the, the blue line is the spawning stock. Um, that's where it should have been. This is, the red line is the exploitation rate. That's where it should have been. People said, well, why is the stock continuing to decline? Because simply, if you went back to that other graph, you're overexploiting it. There was no mystery. It was a fairly simple result. And in fact, for 20 years, the scientific advice was you're overexploiting the stock and it will decline, and that turned out to be correct, even though it was disputed every year and is still disputed every year since. Um, but fundamentally, the population dynamics was simple. You were killing them too fast, so they died. Um, that's the same picture. So what happens in these things in a policy setting? It's my favorite kind of data because I just made it up. Um, so suppose this is the status of the resource. It's going down. Do to over-exploitation, and you've got some science warnings in the pink line that keep saying, you know, it's getting really, you're really over-exploiting. I used to be, before I was the manager for this fish, the fishery in the Northeast, I was the guy going to the management councils and delivering the science advice. And I used to call my job a thousand ways to say you're killing too many fish. Too many fish are dying, the, over, the exploitation rate is too high, you know, the exploitation pattern is wrong, you can say it a thousand ways, basically you were killing too many fish, and the warnings continue to go up. And as they do, the political resistance goes up. And therefore, the stock continues to go down because the management response is to that political resistance. You know, as, as the, so here's a little blip in the status of the resource in the middle. Well, that's taken by, man, you know, that's taken by political response as, aha, the science was all wrong, which means management backs way off and therefore, the re resource declines even more quickly. So you can sort of trace through the sets of, of advice or and the response. So why is management backing off? Well, because where does that political resistance come from? Probably none of you were writing, or your parents were writing to your congressman saying, I'm really worried about fisheries. But you can bet that a lot of fishermen were. 
So why are they resisting something that might stop that resource decline? It's not because they don't understand it. It's not because they're bad people. It's because it's going to have an immediate impact on them, and there isn't any means of them to, 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 be, to step aside for a few years from their livelihood. There's no alternative livelihood that's anywhere near what they can earn in fisheries. So the result of that, I, I will be the only lecturer on this course who has ever been hung in effigy. Um, that's me up there. Um, that's my colleague Pat Kirkle being hung on the other side. This is a demonstration in Gloucester Harbor where I live um, against rules to restrict the fishery. And along the front are representatives from each of the elected officials' offices saying, the poor fishermen, you really shouldn't implement these rules to, because they will be impacted. And by the way, nobody else is watching or is going to change their vote because of fishery rules. Um, so that political resistance is intense on the people who are approximately affected by any set of regulations. And it's not a surprise. It's not anything that you wouldn't expect to happen. Um, but it's very difficult to work through, which is why you had all those management stanzas that really had no effect. Because if you want to succumb to the political resistance, take a big action that has no effect. Works really well. So um, in 19, uh, end of 1994, um, I became the manager, the so-called Northeast Regional Administrator for Fisheries. My second week on the job was closing these three areas on George's Bank. A year later, that one was a very popular guy. Um, it's about 8,000 square miles of the ocean um, to at least begin to halt that overexploitation pattern. And here's the result. I have to show this graph no matter what I'm talking about, whether it's fisheries or anything else. So there's the abundance of cod, haddock, and yellowtail flounder. I became regional administrator there, which was the implementation of Amendment 5. And thereafter, the stocks got better. So that's why I have to show the graph every time. Now, this wasn't me implementing it, obviously. There's a, it's finally coming to the point where you can get enough political backing so that I was allowed to do what was pretty blindingly obvious, stop overexploiting to see if you can turn the stock around. So there was no mystery about it. It wasn't like, I just thought this up and nobody had ever thought of it before, that we really shouldn't hammer this thing into the ground. It's, you had a, a, a enough um, convergence of political forces such that you could actually implement what was needed to conserve the natural capital and rebuild, particularly the haddock resource. And I'll skip on to, well, um, same thing for the aggregate biomass across the 19 stocks in the groundfish complex. So an overall recovery, even though haddock was the most dramatic. Interesting quote from my colleague John Brodziak. That was the first time since the early 1900s that the stock hadn't been overexploited. And that wasn't a big surprise, because in the 1930s, the person who founded the, uh, um, the fishery service reported that Haddock was overexploited. So this wasn't new results. It just took 70 years to implement regulations. Again, you know, it's, it's nice to feel good about your job, but you know, there was, it, it, I happened to um, be in the job at the time when those political forces were in the right place. And since then, there's been increasing difficulties as well, but it's been carried forward by Pat Kirkle, who's done an extraordinary job of trying to maintain that recovery and has been vilified for it to an incredible extent, in addition to being hung in effigy. Um, for sea scallops, the recovery was faster because they have a really nice feature. When you close an area, they don't swim. They just kind of lie on the bottom like a rock and grow really, really fast until you allow somebody to catch them. So the recovery of this population was remarkable, and the recovery in price, product quality, and revenue to the fleet also was fairly remarkable, even though fuel costs and some other costs increased at the time. Because in 1994, they were making 10 to 14 day trips. Now they can do the same for a better value product in three days. It's worth an awful lot more. It's larger scallops, and three days cost you a lot less than 14 days. Um, so, you know, a fairly straightforward result. These people are still bitterly complaining that it's not, you know, but if you let them alone, they could go back out there and make a whole lot more money, even by hammering the stock down again, even though they've made quite a lot of money by this recovery. 
Why is that? Well, because it's still a resource that's out of sight and out of mind to most people. And they're right. They could make an awful lot of money in the short term, retire, do something else. And that's correct. So the political battle doesn't end just because you've shown proof of concept. I'm not trying to depress you. That's just the way it goes. I'm going to skip this. And finally, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about an effort that CI is engaged in to try to actually understand that full chain of um, theory of change from ecosystem health to ecosystem services to human well-being. And we're beginning to construct an ocean health index with the partners that you see here that can be scaled, as I described before, whoops, from an ecosystem out to a global scale analysis. And it's, instead of basing it on what we think should be in the ocean, we've based it around a set of societal goals. So food provisioning services, subsistence harvest, and the things that you see here are at least nominally fairly straightforward societal goals, which are a measure of health as opposed to deciding what we want the ecosystem to look like. And the idea then is you try to measure these in a fairly um, complete way with a set of indices that are become synthetic. So you end up with a number for food provisioning, a number for subsistence harvest or clean water at whatever scale you're working at. And you can measure progress through time. Now, there's a number of really big challenges there. One of them is you need to get down to the short list, as I described before. A second one is it can't just be current status. So actually, it's status, trend, sustainability, and resilience. To change is a component of each part of the index. It has to be fully transparent, transparent, and people have to accept that the societal goals, in fact, are reasonable goals, regardless of how they weight them one to the other. So then you've got this index. The real worry is either it never changes, so it's like the threat level is orange in an airport. It's been orange for 10 years. It doesn't tell you anything. Nobody knows what to do with the answer. So you have to avoid that. You want something that is responsive, but you also want something that people can actually drill down to the scale at which they're working or for the goal that they most care about. So ultimately, we think that's possible. We'll release it in the new year for seafood, for the whole set of goals, where you can actually go into a website and look for a global analysis at how well do we think different areas of the ocean are doing for each of the 10 goals. Why is that the case and what actions might result in a change in, in that ocean health? So going back directly to that theory of change, it can't be just about fisheries because fisheries are not the measure of ocean health. They might get me yelled at a lot, but there's lots of other things that go on in the ocean. So um, trying to now have an integrated index of whether in fact we're providing ecosystem services is a pretty near-term goal at CI. And I've talked a little bit too long, so I think I'm going to stop there, and thank you, and hope there's some questions. <laughs>